Hi, everyone. How are you? Welcome to panel eight, portrayals of BPD in pop culture, TV, books, or film, finding voices for hope and recovery. My name is Courtney Walsh, and I will be um, moderating for today. I'm here from Long Island in New York, and we welcome you to share in the chat box where you're coming from as well, if you choose to. Um, so bear with me while I just pull up a slide. The Emotions Matter is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. It was founded in 2015 to support, educate, and advocate for those impacted by borderline personality disorder. Uh, to learn more about us and our programs, you can go to emotionsmatterbpd.org or you can head to the expo. And to share our philosophy, Emotions Matter strives to create a safe, judgment-free space for people with borderline personality disorder. We accept that there is a spectrum of experiences within the BPD community. We honor where people are in their journey without judgment or assumptions. We encourage people to define their own path toward recovery. And we speak as experts of our own lived life and not as medical experts. Um, so just to start, I want to introduce our speakers who have joined us today. Um, we have Kimberly Rolfe, and she is a New York-based writer and producer. Her first original web series, Life or Death, basically, which she created and wrote about her experiences dealing with borderline personality disorder, premiered in 2018 and was an official selection of the New Media Film Festival and an International Independent Film Award recipient. We will also be hearing from Eric Furtuck, who is an associate professor of psychology at the Clinical Psychology PhD program of the City University of New York Graduate Center and a graduate of the Columbia University Center for Psychoanalytic Training and Research. He has been working with individuals with BPD for the last 20 years clinically, as well as in his research. Um, we may also be hearing from Rupa Gray, Rupa has been a fierce advocate for mental health wellness since 2007 after completing a dialectical behavioral therapy program in San Francisco. She lives successfully with emotion dysregulation disorder in um, San Francisco with her husband and son and a yellow lab. She grew up in the US, though born in India and speaks Punjabi frequently, fluently, sorry. She began her advocacy as a public speaker through NAMI and is presenting diverse audiences before becoming a NAMI trainer. She's a certified WRAP facilitator, advanced level certified peer specialist through both RAMS and RA International, and received the NAMI California Peer Award in 2016. She was also a current member of the RAMS SIP training, sorry, team that was received, that received the MHSA Team of the Year Award for 2020. Rupa loves all things creative, especially the performing arts. She believes that life doesn't have to be black or white. We can learn to live in the gray area. Her philosophy is that we all have made mistakes and we all deserve to be happy. Recovery if is possible. If I can do it, so can you. Rupa has volunteered with Emotions Matter as a BPD Connections program speaker. And the last person that we will be hearing from today is Rebby Ratner. Uh, Rebby entered the borderline universe consciously when she was diagnosed at the age of 39. She spent several years in search of answers and finally arrived in a treatment center that directly addressed that which she had been missed by so many other mental health professionals. She thinks BPD and PD treatments serve as a map to the other and the self. As such, she created a YouTube channel, Borderline Notes, housing over 450 videos an offshoot to feature her documentary, Borderline, um, in hopes of dem oh my goodness, democratizing access to quality information and information about BPD and NPD diagnosis. The channel is becoming its own awesome burgeoning community. Many experts are featured on this channel and the channel is gradually expanding its scope and programming, recently adding sessions to the mix. So there are this is our speakers for today. Um, I'm going to be facilitating by asking a few questions and all speakers will be responding. Um, so just to get started, the first question is, who are your favorite TV or film characters with BPD or BPD traits? So do we just 
jump in? Is that how this goes? Whoever, who would ever like to start can, can go ahead. Does anyone want to jump in first? No? Um, I'll, I'll start. I'll start. Um, so I, the other day we were talking like, could we add books to the mix? And I think I personally somehow um, appreciate discovering that someone mm -hmm. has sort of a borderline psychopathology. For me, that's like really interesting. And so um, I would say one of my favorite um, characters in fictional characters in general is from this series called My Brilliant Friend, which um, in which these two friends growing up in Naples uh, grew up over time. And one of them, I think the more borderline one is really plagued with just deep and complex and unclear emotional life. And you watch how opportunities sort of sift through her fingers and she never, she comes close, but she never quite achieves a certain stability needed to really launch herself. But she's brilliant and heartbreaking and um, sort of wraps, wraps her intelligence around like every character, you know, with whom she interfaces. So that would be, did Courtney just disappear? Did I? I was trying to figure that out. Can yeah, you hear me? It's, yeah, but we can't see you. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Which is weird. <laughs> but Let me. She shared her slides. Oh, maybe that's why. I think that was it, sorry. Um, did anyone else want to comment on the first question? I can pull it back up. Can you still see the slide actually? Yeah. Okay, yeah. fantastic. Um, I mean, for me, I think I think the more, the probably the character in, in film and TV that I've like found the most relatable with BPD has been uh, Rebecca from Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. Um, I felt like that was sort of the, well, it's obviously a sort of very dramatized experience. Like it's a musical comedy. Um, I do feel like at the heart of it, it feels very uh, true to my own experience. Um, and it's also helpful uh, that something so in, uh, so prominent in pop culture took on that topic. And I had a lot of friends who really didn't know much about BPD before, um, who were exposed to it through that show, which I think is really cool. Um, but I do sort of feel like my, I feel like I'm, I'm still waiting for a character that I feel like fully encompasses my experience of BPD. I'm not sure that it has been created yet or that I have seen it yet. Um, something that I feel like really uh, encompasses all of the, all of the, the different ways it can feel to have this disorder. Sorry, I'm just trying to help Rupa get um, access to the audio right now. Uh, Rupa, did you try clicking the uh, microphone to the left side on, in the blue column? Um, but maybe try leaving and then coming back again if you're able to. In the meantime, does anyone else want to comment or add a little bit of that? Um, well, while we're waiting for Rupa. 
Um, first of all, just hi, everybody. And it was good to meet some of you, most of you, the other day in the panel um, and get to know a little bit about you. And I wanted to thank um, Paula and Emotion Matter for inviting me to be part of this. And I saw a little bit of the earlier uh, inspirational panel. Pretty amazing. Um, uh, and actually, this conference is something I've never seen anything like it. I've been part of anything like it. I've read that like, the script in terms of, um, you know, us being sort of like the researchers or clinicians who work with DPD being in the minority, and most of the panelists and participants being people who have the diagnosis and not various things we covered. Um, and so um, I didn't really quite know how to prepare for this panel, but because it's because it's so different. But um, I did did start to kind of re-familiarize myself with a lot of the movies and the characters and some of the shows that I'd heard of. Some of them I hadn't heard of. Um, some of them I've heard of but hadn't seen. Um, and um, I don't know if I have a favorite, but I'll just mention two that maybe maybe we can go back to at some point, but. Um, I remember watching this show called Love on one of the streaming services. I don't remember which one, maybe Netflix. Um, and there's a character in there, um, uh, Mickey. Uh, she's um, she works at like in, in like a, a film studio or, or a, like a radio studio or something like that. And she um, is kind of a interesting character who's who's a bit volatile, a bit not quite sure what she wants to do with her life. Um, and in and out of uh, relationships, she's got an alcohol problem. She clearly abuses alcohol and sometimes drugs. And um, uh, she has this wry, witty sense of humor. At the same time, she makes decisions that you wonder, like, what is she, <laughs> what is she thinking? She puts herself at risk. Um, and um, seems to really make poor decisions in relationships. And the other char main character of the story is a guy um, who really falls in love with her. Um, and it seems like, you know, he's kind of a nerdy, decent guy um, who really seems to love her, but she, she in various ways can't ever kind of let him love her. Um, and, and much of this, this series is about how they're kind of on again, off again, romance and it's a little bit stormy at times and um, I think nicely captures some of the relationship dynamics and she herself as the character reminded me of uh, at least one or two patients I've had who kind of acted a little bit like her looked like her um, and um, you know uh, I found myself having similar reactions to her life as I did to some of my uh, the people I've worked with lives so um, Could you repeat the name and the show again? Because I didn't hear it. Sorry. Yeah, it's called Love. Okay. And I think that's what it's called. It's called Love, and yeah. and the, the character, her, it's a female character, but her name is Mickey. So, or everyone calls her Mickey anyway. Um, okay. Um, I had written to the chat box because I'm having a lot of issues today. I'm so sorry, you guys. Um, hi, I'm Rupa, and my favorite, I think, is BoJack Horseman. Um, I haven't seen Love, though, and I'm looking forward to seeing that. I love Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, um, and I also love, like, Jessica Jones and Fleabag. Um, but I think my favorite is BoJack Horseman because even though he is a horse, um, all of the people in this show are animals. Um, but it's um, it's just a half hour comedy, but it's also very serious. And Bojack Horseman is the name of the show and it's the name of the main character. And it's a man and he had very early childhood fame and is sort of a washout now. And um, that's where it starts. Um, and the reason I love him is because he's he's very flawed. He makes a lot of mistakes. And he has a lot of guilt and shame. And when we meet him, he's sort of trying to make things better and improve. I mean, he makes a lot of mistakes, but he's 
he's trying to counter that. He's trying to um, work on himself and become a better person. Um, and I just feel like, even though according to society, what, what I think I've done might not be wrong or bad or evil, in my head, sometimes I feel like I'm this horrible person and I have all this shame and guilt. And I think that's a huge part of BPD. Um, it is for me. And um, anyway, so I'm, I wanna say BoJack Horseman and it's on um, Netflix. It's played by Will Arnett. Thank you, Rupa. So I think everyone answered, so I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next question. How did the character's journey mirror your own understanding or experiences? And what did you learn about yourself or about BPD from the character? I'll just say I just answered that. <laughs> Go ahead, guys. <laughs> I mean, I think, I don't know if for me, I would say that I really learned anything about myself that I didn't know watching Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. It sort of was just, I feel like it was less so helpful for me in understanding myself and more so helpful as something that I could point people to as being sort of an example of like, yes, this is, maybe some of the stuff that I would do if I kind of uh, had absolutely no like sense of uh, regulation or if I really had just, uh, if my symptoms were just running rampant and I wasn't coping with them. Um, but I, I feel like I, um, I don't know. I don't know that that crazy ex-girlfriend is the show that helped me to understand myself more. But there is a show, and I should have mentioned this previously. Um, but it's actually not about a character with BPD. It's about a character with dissociative identity disorder. Um, it's called United States of Terra with Tony Collette, and um, I feel like that that show was actually really really helpful for me in seeing that there is a person with this really debilitating illness, which is how BPD has felt to me at several points in my life, but that was still capable of sort of um, having a really loving marriage and a really, um, and, a, and a life that felt uh, sort of more full than just her disorder. Um, so that that's something that I, I found helpful in understanding myself earlier on, but that isn't a specifically BPD character. I mean, I think, um, again, I'll refer back to my brilliant friend and I don't know why, um, something about like writing allows me to, um, reading versus watching things somehow I don't know, it allows me to sometimes enter into an experience in a deeper way or something. Um, and so I think what was interesting about reading it, and by the time I was reading that book, I had had knowledge of my diagnosis um, for at least four or five years. So I was somewhat educated about it and myself. Um, and this character was not identified as borderline, but I was like, oh yeah, she's she's pretty borderline. And um, and I think what was interesting about it was because she wasn't identified as borderline, I as the audience member got to experience her the way maybe other people experience her. So it gave me insight into, even though I'm not this person, but um, maybe how other people also experienced me and sort of the confusion in, you know, of dealing with someone like me back in the day, you know, and that was, uh, so that's a, that's an, a, I like that, I liked that about that book because I was so mystified and, and yeah, it was just a very, uh, like, so the physical feeling experience of this person and how I felt and reacted to her was, was, you know, palpable and visceral and possibly helpful to my being able to so-called mentalize the experience other people 
might have of me, how I might look from the outside and how other people's internal life might be a little bit in that interaction with me or from a past me or someone like me. So, yeah. I think for me too, I, I just wanted to mention, um, I, I, I'm not sure if these are in the resource list, but the first time it, anything ever kind of related with me was well before I was diagnosed as well. Cause I, I was diagnosed at 32 with BPD, but at 19, I read uh, Girl Interrupted um, by Susanna Kaysen. And at some age early on, I read Prozac Nation. And those were the first two books that I read. Um, and I actually, the, the way that Rebbe is saying, it's like I actually related to them. And I didn't know that it was borderline. They didn't know it was borderline. Um, but those are two excellent books. The movies are good too, but the books, when they came out at that time in like, it was like early nineties, um, it was just such a breakthrough because I hadn't read anything like that before. Eric, would you like to add anything before we move on to the next question? No, I think I'll skip this one. So the next question, um, how have the portrayals of the characters in TV and film changed over time? I mean, I feel like they're, they've become more specifically connected to the actual diagnosis of BPD, as opposed to sort of the uh, the idea of it or portraying the symptoms, but not ever actually naming anything. Um, and I feel like that, I mean, that is a really important step forward to me. I think this is more so part of the next question. So we'll talk more about that later, but um, I think it's, uh, it's, it's become more important to actually name it in a way um instead of just showing oh somebody has these symptoms that may or may not be this or it may be something else you know i want to agree with revy that's exactly what i was thinking and exactly what i was going to say is well like in prozac nation and in girl interrupted you know they're never diagnosed um with bpd um and so it's such a difference now that on Crazy Ex-Girlfriend or on Bojack Horseman, they will say BPD. And also for those of us who have always felt very alone and thought, wow, I really relate with these characters, but it doesn't just seem like depression. It doesn't just seem like bipolar, it's something else. To actually know what it is to have that label today, for me, not for everyone, but for me, I'm, I'm so glad I finally got that label. I'm so glad I finally knew what was wrong with me. Um, and it took, you know, 16, 17 years of actively being in therapy to get there. So I agree. I think the fact that they are giving it a name, even though that is controversial, I think that's great because people like me and, and hopefully others, like we feel less alone. Like, oh my God, there's somebody out there in a book or a film that they're admitting this. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting because I think context, I mean, this a little bit jumps to the next question, but um, I do, like, I was just, I was looking up, you know, what are films with BPD characters and like Eternal Sun Sunshine of the Spotless Mind came up, right? Which I loved that movie. <laughs> and I, and I was, um, in, you know, mystified by the Kate Winslet character in it. Um, it's been years since I've seen it, but um and there's something there's something to be said for both naming and not naming and i think it's so context dependent um so i don't even know if you know uh the person who wrote eternal sunshine of the spotless mind had bpd in mind when it was written you know i have no idea they could have looked up diagnoses as a writer and been like, I need, I'm trying to write a character and there is a psychopathology and I'm going to start to research psychopathologies. Mm -hmm. And then, 
be an artist and write this with that like information sort of in me and I'll see what comes up or I know someone like this and I'm going to start to iterate this person, you know, in writing and then someone's going to act them out and whatever. So I have no idea what, what the intention was behind the person who wrote it, but I do think, um, you know, um, like we were talking the other day about that, the movie that came out, the come to, what was it? The one with, um, Kristen Wiig. Do you guys remember what that yeah, was? Yeah, Welcome to Me, I think. Yeah. Well. Which I, I admit I saw like a portion of. I just, it was so not good that I just didn't bother watching the whole thing. But even the commercials were so like textbook, this behavior is now going to be translated into this scene. And so I think that, in my opinion, the important thing with the translation would be that it's not. Um, that it's a very organically written thing that gets translated and it's not someone writing it who's sort of uh, taking these textbook symptoms and applying them to a character. Um, and so I guess the only danger in today in people doing it is because it is a more known diagnosis today. You know, it is going to inherently have that happen to it more now i think than in the past and so there will be pros and cons to the naming of it in that i think it will become simplified in certain instances which probably doesn't do much good and you know in certain instances it'll be the you know kimberly's statement about how you know i haven't found that character yet that sort of fully iterates the wholeness of the experience. And there may be many, but I think there's something to feel in the wholeness of an experience that, you know, is so hard to capture. And I, pro I tend to agree with you, Kimberly. Like, I don't think I've, I feel like actually the character in My Brilliant Friend, the book, sort of because you see this person over a 60 year period and you watch this person in the throes of sort of their development and in so many different relationships and in work situations and as a parent. And so you're watching it iterate in all of these ways and it's done so well. So you feel a wholeness to that, that, um, that it, you know, maybe hasn't yet been, been captured. I don't know that that really answers this, the question, but. I, I think, I mean, I agree as well with you guys, because, I mean, I haven't seen any BPD characters who are not white. So, you know, I, there's definitely not um, a great representation out there, just like, you know, in a panel yesterday, we were saying, well, there's there's hardly any information about um, people of color with BPD. But the issue is that there just isn't that much out there with BPD. So whether you know, half the people leave the diagnosis vague so people can relate to it more and half the people name it as BPD. I think whatever is out there, whether they're naming it or not, you know, it's adding. Like, Welcome to Me is is, is not a good example. A lot of us, I think we were discussing the other day, I, I know I didn't really like that one, but at least people are trying and making stuff because mm. there is there just isn't that much. So we have to relate to, just like I'm sure people with other, um diagnoses even physical health diagnoses there's a lot of people who they're not represented in the media um and i think a lot of us on this panel are actually very creative so we have filmmakers and writers and you know maybe someone here or maybe one of you guys will be able to you know move that forward i think it will have to come from someone who's lived it I could be wrong, but we'll see, but we'll see who does it. But because I do think there's a non preciousness that you have to have when you talk about it in a way. Anyway, we'll see, we'll see, you know, and crazy ex-girlfriend was sort of able to do that through comedy, um, you know, and, and song where they could, they could turn like dicey topics that people would maybe call trigger warning on into, something that was palatable and safe, you know? Um, and so, you know, you that's, a, but I think you have to be able to thread that line in a way where you're like entering extremely uncomfortable spaces and people are, 
are there for the ride. I think one place where I have seen this done successfully, and I also uh, am trying my hand at it, is just stand-up comedy because we have, you know, there's there's all this joking in, in comedy that, uh, and several comedians say this, including Jim Carrey, and, you know, they'll say like, well, you know, if you're a stand-up comic, obviously there's something wrong with you mentally. And um, what I've seen is people go into really dark, interesting areas through comedy, um, just like what you were saying about Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. I mean, I think that in order to take this journey, there's going to be a lot of different approaches, and one definitely needs to be comedy because we are dealing with such sensitive matter. We're dealing with such... Um, it, it can be a dark journey. So if people are going to stay interested and watch, you know, like like yeah. we said, Crazy Ex-Girlfriend is like song and dance and laughter. Um, I think that's a huge component. But you also know, like those those are probably Eric knows as well as you know a treater in your own different way, right? We all know. I mean, if you stand back and look at some of your life experiences, I mean, it's funny. I mean, it wasn't funny in the moment, but if you were to like tell it, I mean, there's things I've done. You know, but oh yeah, you can yeah, render definitely. it pretty funny. I mean, it's pretty unbelievable that you did what you did. You know, it's like the emails I've sent. Oh my god, <laughs> you know, e diagnosis. Oh my god, you know. That's why I think, like at least for me, stand up is a great um, outlet because I can write things down in my journal. And this is what I do: is I write things down in my journal, and they come across so bitter and resentful and. But it's okay. It's only for my journal. Only I'm reading it. And then when I do my comedy, I take those same things and take out the bitterness and laugh at it. Because, yeah, I've done, I mean, I, you know, I've made a lot of mistakes. Um, and I'm very humble about it. I, I've, I've made a lot of, a lot of mistakes. And so, yeah, I mean, I think that ultimately the laughter part of it is what's healing. Um, like Bojack Horseman has funny aspects, but overall it's very raw. It's very dark. Um, so I think the comedy part just really, really helps. Laughter is healing is, is what I've heard. And I think it's a good coping mechanism for me. I was just going to say uh, one of my observations, just through all these, the evolution of these TV shows and movies is is the introduction of yeah um, a comic element which is uh, you know when you think back to like glenn close and michael douglas and fatal attraction um which is an early paradigmatic you know dpd film supposedly um it's really more of like a tragic horror movie it's like she, the the bpd character she victimizes others and she ends up being almost by the end, quite sociopathic in a horror film kind of way. Um, like she's almost like a <laughs> the character in a horror film you can't kill or something. Um, and now the, most of the things in the last 10, 15 years are much less that, that the p person with BPD is the victimizer, but the victim usually, or at least a more, much more sympathetic character. Um, and um, and there's a yeah, there's a, often a hum, humorous component to to the character or their observations or you know their relationships that um, I think is a major evolution. Um, and there's also been a, a lot more of a, a in the in the dramatic sense a dramatic component to the more recent BPD movies where um, you know either the either the diagnosis is romanticized in some way but not just the deficits, but the strengths associated with it, um, or the sensitivities associated with it. Um, and also this theme that kind of through relationships, you can get healing. And so um, there's often a quality in some of the films, like uh, I just rewatched, well, I was gonna bring this up later, but we, I just rewatched uh, the Johnny Cash story, um, Walk the Line, and I've been developing this theory that he might have BP, have had BPD, um, and and that 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 whole arc of that movie um, is about how he's able to finally have a, a love relationship with June Cash. 
after all this tumultuous drug abuse and difficult marriage and you know difficulties with his career and all this stuff. So those seem like two big, the, kind of the romantic and the comedic are big additions um, that into the latest BPD media. Yeah. Yeah, I think that Glenn Close, like that character, like you're saying, she was so one dimensional. I mean, it wasn't just that she is a BPD character. She was just, that's all she was. Like she has no other life, you know, and with other characters, like with Bojack, he was a famous movie star and he's an actor. And with Rebecca, you know, she's a lost, uh, I'm sorry, she's a lawyer. She's, um, you know, we have multidimensional lives. We're not just one thing. And I also want to say, you know, I'm, I'm kind of talking about the redemption stories and how I really relate to them, but I just want to iterate that, you know, we all make mistakes. It's not just people with BPD who make mistakes and feel guilty and have shame. We're not the only people. So it's not like you're only going to relate if you have BPD. We all make mistakes and we all do dumb things. And that's why when we watch stuff to make it, um, when we watch stuff on TV, we, we're laughing at ourselves essentially. Yeah. I do see a comment that mentions um, Johnny Cash's song, Hurt. So I'm oh, no, I, yeah, I, right. Oh, that's you. It's I'm like sorry. <laughs> it's like self-harm. That, 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 um. Well, it's actually a Nine Inch Nails song that he did a cover of. Oh, that's yeah. right. That is. Yeah. That is. But he did a better cover than they'll ever yeah. do. Yeah. yeah. So that's well, like, that's... I always think he's the originator of that song. You're right. Of course. But listening to it, it's, he sings it with such empathy. You think he, he. He knows that pain, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, that's right. I always think he just like took that song and basically owned it. Um, but yeah, I mean, and the thing is that because BP, because so many other diagnoses seem, I mean. I don't know what's the going statistic. I think it's 2.6 or 2.7 percent of the U.S. population is currently diagnosed, but that potentially misses like, you know, I don't know half of the like sub. I'm not going to say half. You know, the substance use disorder population. Um, oh yeah, but Valerie's just saying Janice Joplin, Jim Morrison. Did you guys see the um, Nina Simone documentary? Did anyone see that? I, I'm telling you, she was diagnosed as bipolar. Holy, you just watch it and you're like, uh-uh, no way. That is not bipolar. That is borderline. I don't want to call Nina Simone borderline, God forbid. But like, you watch this, you watch her, you watch her love, her, her like affect regulation stuff, her, yeah. her like dystymia. Um, you know, it wasn't like she had sort of like these manic, florid, you know, disconnected from reality, not like misperceiving an interpersonal exchange disconnected from reality. But, you know, these, I was like, this woman is not bipolar. And I actually think so many films and, and documentaries that identify um, people as bipolar, like when you watch them, I'm like, mm, that's right. It. Not sure about that one. Oh yeah, Persistent. Um, yeah, and, and Diana is what. Um, if you read Andy Warhol was a hoarder, he talks about her in there as well, um, and he talks about her having an eating disorder and uh, and all these other things. But if if you guys read that book as well, it has all of these people in there. I mean, there's so many celebrities that you know now that they're they're gone, we can say, oh wow, they had this. <laughs> Yeah, and, and Rupa, you just mentioned this in the chat, but I just wanted to bring up the, since we're talking about historical figures, the um, Marilyn Monroe probably had BPD thing, oh, which yeah. is a pretty, pretty commonly, but there is a really great, um, she was married to Arthur Miller for a time, the playwright, mm -hmm. and uh, he has this really great play called After the Fall, which is... Um, I mean, it's about it's about a lot of things, but in that in that uh, play, it's a really uh, really specific sort of almost literal 
uh, depiction of, of his relationship with Marilyn. And that I think to me is probably the closest, I mean, it's absolutely heartbreaking, but it's the closest thing I've ever read or seen to being like, these are things that I have said to people. Like I have said these exact words. I have had this fight a million times. Like it's just, ab I, it's absolutely, I feel like it's almost, it's really hard to read. So don't read it if you're not in a good place, but um, I, I feel like it's sort of essential reading or essential viewing if you can ever see it. Uh, can you write that? For, can you? Can you yeah, I'll put it in the chat. Also, I think uh, to piggyback off that is my week with Marilyn. If you read or see that, um, that's a really great depiction. I don't know if it's as good as I haven't seen the one that you just brought up, but mm -hmm. that was the other one. Um, but in, if you if if you know, I always hear like, no, Marilyn Monroe didn't really have this, or she did have this. I'm like, well, read her biographies, and and I love this book. Andy Warhol was a hoarder. Um, it talks about Andy Warhol and his hoarding, but it talks about many famous people, including Abraham Lincoln, who had depression. And it talks about how um, the reason I'm bringing this up is I really want to put it out there because this book is about how these celebrities, these famous, talented people, they they were famous and they were talented because of their mental health challenge, not in spite of it. So because they had these issues, they had something different, and that's what propelled them. Um, and I love that. I'm not I'm not saying if I agree or disagree, I think it's a great thing to posit, which is these people excelled because they had this, this issue, they had these issues, they had these problems, and so this was their way of dealing with the pain. Um, so yeah, another really good book. I mean, even like as of late, so are we not allowed to, I'm not going to die. Are we not allowed to like diagnose living celebrities? Anyone? I I really like the, when I talk about Brandon Marshall and Pete Davidson, I, I say their names as they're people who have said themselves right. that they have BPD, right. but then there's people like Selena Gomez or Demi Fiona Lovato. Apple. Sometimes they have, right. Well, Fiona Apple. Yes. She says that. But like other ones identified? don't always say it, right? Like, like Selena go. Have they identified though as it? But sometimes they do. And sometimes they say they have bipolar, which, you know, for all the people who say bipolar disorder and PTSD and I'm a woman, so I have BPD, but as a man, he has PTSD. Like we're, you know, there's, there's really a lot of stuff going on here. And so, like you said, like the 2.7% that's actually diagnosed, that's obviously not accurate you know? Yeah. I mean, the other thing I often did wonder a little bit, but I could be wrong, um, you know, with men in the diagnosis, but this is like a different panel. Uh, I'm, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I, but we were talking about people was, you know, um, because of physical act, physical aggression is more common in men outward at others. And right. to be honest, more men than if they're anger management, physically aggressive, it would be like a good um, relation, uh, like uh, what's it called? Um, human relation, what's the thing? Um, you know, it'd be a good sort of uh, packaging BPD because it would make them look less bad. I mean, it has, it had, it would have a little bit more um, it would probably actually generate a little more empathy in their their cause. So what would I'm sorry? Could you? I always think that, that I, but I don't know. I'm not a therapist, and I'm like never going to pretend to play that game. And I will say solidly in my not a therapist lane. But I do wonder, <laughs> like, because I because I am not, and I don't have the air. You know, the um, none of us I'm are, or I'm not. I'm right, not either. So I, but I do <laughs> wonder with men um, who end up you know, having, um, you know, anger, huge anger management stuff, or, you know, where their aggression isn't placed back on themselves, but, you know, pushed outward at someone else. If, you know, a borderline diagnosis would rest would help them. Help them hurt? Well, yeah, and it would also sort of maybe rescue them from the trouble of, being identified as just an abuser. You know what I mean? Like Sure, but most men don't want to be called. They don't want to say they have BPD. 
I mean, it's a lot easier for a man to be told he has PTSD and I'm not a therapist. I just read a lot. Um, now these articles, if you look at some of these things like, yeah, a lot of people who have PTSD actually have BPD or maybe they're the same or maybe they overlap or whatever. Um, these are all coming out now, things that maybe a lot of us have been saying for years, but remember that BPD was, used to be called hysteria and only women can have hysteria because only we have ovaries. So if I'm a woman, I have BPD, but this man who's a veteran who has the same symptoms, he, he has PTSD because that's more legitimate. Um, so, you know, there's there are a lot of people with a lot of the same symptoms or similar symptoms and you know, and I've been saying this for years and it's like now it's it's actually coming out. Yeah. I mean, a lot more women in my DBT group, there were seven women and one man. And I, I, I know that there are men out there with BPD um, and I know there are women out there with PTSD. And I, you know, it's the whole personality disorder thing. I'm sorry, I'm going to let you talk. I just want to say the whole personality disorder thing. I mean, to me, they're both anxiety disorders. There's no such thing as a personality disorder unless you want to count like narcissism or something, which I think is a subset. But like under my borderline personality disorder umbrella, I have depression, I have OCD. Um, so I just want to put those things out there, like think about the people who are being diagnosed with, with borderline, uh, I'm sorry, with bipolar because they're, they're, their psychiatrists or therapists have not been trained in DBT, so they don't know how to deal with it and they don't want to touch it with a 10 foot pole. Um, so it is it is super stigmatized even by pro providers. And so again, it's it's easier to say, oh no, you have bipolar, you have PTSD, you have this. Um, yeah, so I, thank you yeah. for listening. Can I just I mean, on some of this as a, I guess as a psychologist. Yeah, please, uh, yeah, go to it. <laughs> um, well, there's a lot here. Um, just to, just to clarify, just some of the some of the data. When you when when you send people to do what we call an epidemiological study, where you have people do a skid, which is the diagnostic interview on a kind of random community sample, um, it it does turn out that across countries, it looks like yeah, you know, somewhere between you know one and five percent of the population meets criteria for BPD, and it surprisingly is about equal men and women. Um, so what, what tends to happen though, is that the, the people who show up for treatment in, in BPD oriented facilities that have DBT or something like that tend to be women and the men, we don't know always what happens to them, but we suspect they, they don't present for those, they don't present for the same problems. They often have substance use problems or they're having problems with aggression or, um, you know, um, the, the, the depression gets diagnosed, but not the underlying personality disorder and uh, or they're getting wrapped up in the legal system perhaps with, um, you know they're, they're getting in domestic abuse situations and getting in trouble um, so that's why I kind of brought up Johnny Cash is because I think he might be a nice illustration of so a, a man who might have BPD and the kind of life trajectory he has brushes with the law difficulties with substances tumultuous marriage and relationships, but not much treatment for, for the BPD if it was there. Um, so, uh, and then add to that the stigma that mental health professionals carry in not wanting to make the diagnosis, even when either they don't, either they don't believe in it or they, even if they see it there, they don't want to make it because they think it, it's stigmatizing. Um, so, you know, in, tra in training psychologists, I run up against this a lot. With, with trainees who don't want to give the diagnosis, even if it's pretty clear. Um, so uh, if, you guys the same. Good, if you guys have any advice or if you'd be willing to talk to my students or- Yeah, I'll talk to your students. <laughs> um, I'm glad I am a trainee, so also I'm a certified really. peer counselor. So that is what we do. So a lot of times they send in people like me, I, I work for Rams in San Francisco and also Baker places and so, we're certified peer counselors, so especially someone like that, you would send in someone like me, a peer um, who's trained, and they would keep seeing you and doing the regular work with you, but also they have a peer. And our job as a peer counselor is I say, I'm not a psychologist, I will not diagnose you, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm here as a peer. And what it shows statistically, at least in California, it's shown that when you have a peer, um, 
especially if someone is transitioning from a psychiatric unit to home or from one level of, of care to another, to have that peer there, it's shown to work in that there's a lot less um, rebound, a lot le less relapse. Um, so something about just speaking with someone with lived experience, which is all of us and probably a lot of people on this call, um, this is something where, you know, I don't have a degree. I don't, I mean, I don't have a master's. I do not diagnose people, but that's my job is I go and talk to people. That's it. Um, and it's, it's simply helping destigmatize, I think. Um, and with BPD, that's a big one. I meet a lot of people who are self-stigmatizing and they don't want to admit they have it. So I don't know. I mean, that's what I'm saying is that is one help, help or one solution. Um, and usually the county pays for this person, so they're not paying us. And we just meet with them like once a week and have coffee or do exercises. I, I think it helps. Yeah, that sounds great. I don't think we have that here in New York. Um, New York has a, uh, they do have a peer certificate program, so they may have peer counselors as well, but I don't know like which counties, because California, we were like the 49th state to get um, certified, a certification. Um, but New York's had a certification for a while. But yeah, I don't know if they, you know, they have a billing code and they're billed by insurance or if they're, you know. Eric, are your are your students ex like predominantly going to be going into personality disorders? Not necessarily, no. no. But some of them want to specialize in that. But even if they don't, they need to be able to right, diagnose. No, clear, that I mean, certainly the ones that want to specialize, they you know, should probably get accustomed to getting comfortable with finding oh, yeah. what I did but, I mean, or they shouldn't do it, yeah. you know. Well, that's why I thought, you know, your, your guys' experience is so... I mean, nice I... I because, because it's, it's the other side, which is how how helpful it can be to get the diagnosis. It's not, it's not pleasant, I'm, and it's not... Fun. It can be a relief I for some. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I was in the system, I was 39, I'd been in therapy since I was 12, 39, so that's 12, 22, that's 27 years for me to get the diagnosis. Let me tell you, I had a library of books because I was trying to figure out what was wrong with me, and I had been to so many different people, and no one would give me the diagnosis, and I was, and I mean... I was ready to tear my hair out. I didn't know that that was the diagnosis, but when I got it, I was like, great, fine. Let's, I mean, I'm not saying that's everyone, you know, and if you're younger and maybe you haven't been sitting around, you know, you haven't been trying to get, get information for 27 years, you may be a little less willing to accept it. But I also feel very strongly I mean, I think you're, as a therapist, you're probably negotiating and getting a sense of how that person is going to tolerate the information, but it's not so much your decision to legislate information that you share with someone that is going to alter the course of their life. And it's a very I mean, serious I decision to make, to choose not to give it. It's a very serious decision. Like serious. And I was very happy to get that diagnosis because I started seeing a psychologist when I was 15, you know, and when I was five or six is when I went to my mom and said, what does depression mean? I mean, I was five or six. And then I was 32 when I got the diagnosis. So for some of us, it's such a huge relief. Like, you mean you actually know there's something wrong with us and it's not just depression and it's not just this or that. I mean, it, it can be... Well, again, I was 32. Um, I was trying very hard for so long to come up with answers. So when I was diagnosed, it was a relief. Um, the other thing I was going to say is if, if you um, connect with a nonprofit called National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI, um, what we do is a lot of us also do a lot of public speaking and training and um, it can really help to watch someone themselves talk about or tell their story. Um, and that can also help maybe kind of mitigate that stigma. But 
I don't think there's any clear answer because I've met people who I started seeing someone because she was told she had borderline personality disorder and then she saw a new doctor and he said he, she didn't have it. So she said, I don't need to see you anymore. I don't really have it. So let's not discuss it. So I, I don't really know what we can do about the stigma, but I think that's why we're all here. I mean, the other interesting thing about the stigma, I I think is like, you don't really have control about how other people think or feel. And in a funny way, those who stigmatize, while it may be very valid because there are people with this diagnosis or whatever the symptoms or characteristics can generate a somewhat you know difficult person at times, but it would seem like, um, I just lost my train of thought here. Oh yeah, the stigma is more, that's really the other person's problem. Like that's not, you know, and that's a little bit the other person's psychopathology or pathology. I mean, like, you know, that that's not such a, you know, robust, healthy thing to do to stigmatize someone. So it is sort of indulging. I mean, I don't know if you could make that argument to patients or whatever, but like, it is sort of indulging a sickness that actually isn't theirs to indulge, you know, and it's not really their business. I not really wanted, my business that you're stigmatizing. Yeah, sorry. sorry I just wanted to make note of the time. We only have about three minutes left. Um, so if everyone just wants to start wrapping up. Are there questions or are, are, do people want to ask questions or? If you do have a question, you can use the Q&A box. There are none. There are no questions as yet. <laughs> <laughs> They're flowing in. Well, the chat is very active, but there's no questions. Yeah. Glad I guess feel free to write it in the chat as well. I know a lot of people have been commenting in the chat too. Yeah. I mean, it's funny. This always goes back to the not getting diagnosed or the getting diagnosed or the, anyway, these conversations, because it all, I don't know if it's been around long enough yet, quote unquote, like right. where this isn't, I mean, I mean, all even this conversation about characters in film, um, you know, like we're not, we're not long enough in yet to have a huge history for this one. That's right. You know? That's right. If we're, we're still in the generation where we, or at least I got to go to DBT to dialectical behavior therapy because it had been invented in my lifetime. But when I was five or when I was 12 and cutting myself or 20 or 25, it wasn't here. There, there wasn't any yet, or it hadn't come out yet. Marshall Linehan hadn't invented it yet. So I feel like in a lot of ways, this is how schizophrenia was looked at maybe 20 years ago. I, I'm not sure, but it was kind of like, everyone thought schizophrenia was something different and it was so stigmatized. And now schizophrenia, there's a lot of information about it everywhere. So I wonder if, you know, I maybe we're right here, us, um, all of us, and are, are hopefully gonna get it to that point someday. Because people still treat it like it's, it's a death sentence or like you can never recover, you know, um, and none of these things are true. I mean, and the other interesting thing about it is if you strip away a lot of the really flashy symptoms, but you still have the core stuff inside. That's sort the of feelings of emptiness and worthlessness and the anger is yeah yeah yes. you know it, it's like the core symptoms yeah it's a it's a it's a much more you know it's a hard it's a complicated thing to shape and talk about because and it's like almost this thing that when I was in treatment you feel like you you feel the BPDness around you or the of other people it's this hard it's this thing that's almost hard to put into language, which is maybe why art is such a good avenue for it, because you can do all these things to, sh to sort of frame it. But it may, you know, 
I don't know. As a versus, say, maybe schizophrenia, but I don't even know because I'm not, I don't know from that experience personally, you know. We do have to get ready to wrap up for today, but on behalf of Emotions Matter, uh, we thank you so much to the panelists for sharing your insights today. Um, there are research, resources that are downloadable and related to the topic at the end of the screen. And just once again, don't forget to check out our silent auction. And um, so you can always text to give as well. Uh, thank you again to our panelists and we hope you enjoyed. Thank you all. Thank you. All. Thank, you. Thank you. Bye everyone. Thank you all. Bye.